Hi, today I'd like to talk about the history which led to the development of the first modern gas turbine engine and its predecessor, the explosion or Holtzworth gas turbine. In hindsight, it often seems like technologies are developed instantaneously in a spark of inspiration by one individual. History produces this deception by assigning credit to one person for having de developed something, whereas in reality, technology is developed through an evolutionary process, building on the work of, other, uh, work of others who came before. In 1791, John Barber took out the world's first patent for an invention which contains all of the components of a modern gas turbine engine. However, concepts that went into this invention can be seen documented as far back as ancient Greece. Barber's engine was intended to drive a horseless carriage. It included a chain-driven compressor, a combustion chamber designed to burn gaseous fuels from wood, coal, oil, or other substances, and a turbine to drive the compressor and carriage. Water was also intended to be injected into the combustion chamber to produce steam, to reduce the temperature of the hot combustion gases, and to increase the volume of the flow to, to produce more work in the turbine. It was never built. However, a modern assessment of the design suggests that given the technologies of the day, the losses would be too great and the turbine would not have been capable of generating enough work to drive the compressor, let alone the carriage. Since 1791, many people have attempted to perfect this concept. Finally, in 1903, Egidius Elling, whose name I'm probably mispronouncing, a Norwegian researcher, was the first to build a working gas turbine engine which generated more power than was needed to drive its own components. He went on to build several prototype engines between 1903 and 1912, but was never able to commercialize his invention. The development of the first commercially successful modern gas turbine engine, as we know it today, is often credited to Sir Frank Whittle, who patented the jet engine in 1930. However, Hans van Owen, who claims to be unaware of Whittle's patent, designed and built the actual world's first operational jet engine, which first flew on the 27th of August 1939. It's not clear whether or not Van Owen was really unaware of Whittle's work, though as we've said, the concept of the gas turbine was not new by this time. However, having said this, a power company in Switzerland, Brown, Bovary and C, or BBC, together with Adolf Meyer, actually designed and built the world's first commercially successful modern gas turbine engine. This was done for the production of electricity. This engine was first operated in July of 1939, roughly one month before Hans van Owen's jet engine first flew. This engine produced four megawatts of power with an efficiency of 17.4%, and it remained in service until 2002 before finally being decommissioned and moved to Beer, Switzerland, where it is currently on display at General Electric's factory there. But this wasn't the first gas turbine engine which BBC developed and sold. In 1908, Hans Holzfart, a German inventor, developed the explosion gas turbine, which is also known as the Holzfart gas turbine. BBC partnered with Holzfart in 1909 and developed its first commercial explosion gas turbine engine, which generated 149 kilowatts of power. BBC continued to produce and sell these engines until 1933. Their later engines were able to produce as much as 1.5 megawatts of power. To illustrate how these engines operated, I've produced this model of an explosion gas turbine engine based on a patent from 1933 by Hans Holtzwart. The model is slowed down so that one can visualize the operation but typically later versions of this engine had a shaft speed of around 3,000 RPM. Air enters the engine through a flange on the lower left into a ring manifold, which supplies the combustion chambers. As this is a later version of this engine, it is likely that the air is compressed to a higher pressure than atmospheric pressure by a separate air compressor. However, earlier versions of this engine were fed uncompressed air. 
To make it easier to see the operation of the combustion chamber, I've taken an extract from Hans Holtzwart's patent on the combustion chamber. In this picture, the flow is reversed to the 3D model. Air enters from the left and exhaust gases exit on the right. There are two valves, one at the inlet of the combustion chamber and one at the exit. Figure one illustrates part of the charging cycle of the chamber. Both the inlet and exit valves are open. Fresh air enters the combustion chamber, pushing out any of the remaining exhaust gases. Fuel is injected into this air through a fuel nozzle located just downstream of the inlet valve. Figure two shows the final stage of the charging cycle where the combustor exit valve is closed. In figure three, the inlet valve is also closed so that the combustion chamber is sealed at both the inlet and outlet. And in figure four, a spark plug near the exit of the combustion chamber is fired, igniting the fuel air mixture inside the combustor. Because the chamber is sealed, the combustion process is a constant volume process, similar to the process which occurs in piston engines. Thus, both the temperature and pressure rise in the combustion chamber. What is not shown in this patent is the exhaust cycle, where it is likely that first the combustor exit valve opens, allowing the hot, high-pressure exhaust gases to flow to the turbine and the pressure inside the combustion chamber to drop. Finally, when the pressure is dropped enough, the combustor inlet valve would reopen, allowing fresh air to enter the combustion chamber again, as is seen in Figure 1. Once the exhaust gases exit the combustor, they are expanded back to atmospheric pressure in a high and low pressure turbine. Both turbines are connected to the same shaft and there is a ring manifold at the exit of both turbines which helps to even out the circumferential distribution of the flow and reduce the circumferential or whirl velocity. The turbine blades are not cooled unlike modern gas turbines which bleed off air from the compressor to cool the hotter high, pres high pressure stages. This limits the maximum exhaust gas temperature uh, from the combustor to relatively low values in order to avoid overheating damage in the turbine. In this design, the high pressure turbine is an impulse turbine, while the low pressure turbine is a reaction turbine. From experience with steam turbines, impulse turbines were found to be able to cope with higher temperatures while reaction turbines offer higher efficiencies. And I'll discuss the differences between these two types of turbines, uh, the benefits and disadvantages of them in a later video. The casing is cooled using water or oil, which is circulated through cavities cut out of the casing, but the rotor shaft is uncooled. Exhaust gases exit the engine, through a single flange in the ring manifold at the exit of the low pressure turbine. Because of the low pressure ratio of the explosion gas turbine engine and consequently high amount of waste heat, the efficiency of this engine is relatively poor. To illustrate this, let's look at the ideal TS diagram for its cycle. The TS diagram is often used by engineers to understand the performance of heat engines. T represents temperature, which I think everyone understands. S represents entropy, which I think is a harder concept to understand. Entropy is the state of chaos of a system. Systems with low entropy are highly ordered, while systems with high entropy are highly chaotic. For example, looking at this wine glass, it is currently in a state of low entropy. It's very ordered. However, if I was to drop it on the floor, which I'm not gonna do because it's a perfectly good, good wine glass, it would shatter into many pieces. And in that state, it would be highly chaotic and have a high entropy. The entropy of the universe is always increasing. It is possible to reduce the entropy of a local system. For instance, we could put this wine glass back together again, um, but this requires work. And as no process is 100% efficient, this will cause the entropy of the rest of the universe to increase even more. Going back to the TS diagram, 
lines of constant pressure are also shown. Constant pressure lines which are lower on the chart represent lower pressures, while lines which are higher on the chart represent higher pressures. In this example, we will look at an early explosion gas turbine engine cycle, where the air enters the combustion chamber uncompressed. Inside the combustor, the combustion process causes the pressure and temperature of the gases to rise. The entropy also rises as the molecules which make up the gases are excited by the, by the rising energy. These gases are then expanded in the turbine back to the inlet pressure. In an ideal cycle, this expansion is assumed to be isentropic. In other words, the entropy doesn't change. In a real engine, there are losses in the turbine, which cause a small increase in entropy. Because the entropy of the exhaust gases is higher than the inlet air, the temperature of the exhaust gases is also higher. This additionally, additional or waste heat in the exhaust gases is lost to the surrounding environment. Now, if we want to understand the efficiency of the engine, we need to look at a couple of equations. For a heat engine, the work produced by the engine is equal to the heat in minus the heat out. Heat can be calculated as the integral of the temperature times the delta in entropy. This can be graphically represented on the TS diagram as the area under the curve. The heat in is the area under the combustor portion of the cycle, where heat is added to the system and the heat out is the area under the constant pressure curve connecting the exhaust gases to the air intake. Thus, the work produced by the engine, which is heat in minus heat out, is simply the area enclosed by the cycle. Now, the efficiency of the engine is determined by the work produced by the engine divided by the heat in. Thus, if we compare visually the area of the work to the area of the heat in on the TS diagram, we get a visual impression of the cycle efficiency. To see the influence of pressure ratio on the engine efficiency, we can compare two cycles for the same temperature ratio. In other words, the same turbine inlet temperature. You can see that as the pressure ratio inside the combustor increases, the entropy increase decreases, and the relative size of the area representing the work to the area representing the heat in increases. Thus, the efficiency increases with increasing pressure ratio. The problem in reality is that the pressure rise and the temperature rise are not independent in this engine. Both are driven by the combustion process. In other words, for the pressure ratio to increase, the temperature ratio also needs to increase so that the exhaust gases expand more, producing a greater pressure rise. As the turbine is not cooled, the exhaust gas temperatures are limited to relatively low values, and consequently this also limits the pressure rise in the combustor. In the early 1930s, BBC, given the material and cooling technologies of the day, recognize this limitation. This is why they dropped the explosion gas turbine in favor of the modern gas turbine engine concept at the time. To understand this, let's now look at the ideal TS diagram of a modern gas turbine engine. In such an engine, the air entering the engine is first compressed by a compressor. Again, in the ideal diagram, the compression process is assumed to be isentropic. However, again, in reality, there are losses in the compressor, which cause a slight increase in entropy. Heat is added in the combustor, following a constant pressure process. In reality, there is a small pressure loss in the combustor, but in the ideal diagram, the combustion process is assumed to be isobaric. In other words, pressure loss is assumed to be zero. Following the combustor, the exhaust gases are expanded in a turbine and then released into the surrounding environment. Comparing the TS diagram for an early explosion gas turbine engine to a modern gas turbine engine with the same pressure and temperature ratio, one can clearly see that the modern gas turbine produces more work at a higher efficiency. 
One also needs to remember that the explosion turbine works in pulses. Between explosions in the combustor, the turbine sees a reduced inlet pressure and reduced flow rate. Losses in the system due to friction, etc., will decelerate the engine between pulses, which will need to be recovered with each new pulse. On the other hand, a modern gas turbine produces power continuously. Thus, the actual work and efficiency for the explosion gas turbine will be even lower compared to a modern gas turbine than this simple analysis suggests. This is the main reason BBC dropped the explosion gas turbine for the modern gas turbine in the 1930s. It is interesting to note that over the last couple of decades, there has been a renewed interest in the explosion gas turbine concept. New material and coating technologies and advances in cooling technologies has allowed for the turbine inlet temperature to rise substantially over engines produced in the 1930s. And it is felt combining a constant volume combustor with a modern gas turbine engine with a compressor and turbine offers the potential to improve engine efficiency. General Electric in particular, but also others, have been carrying out research into pulse detonation combustion. This process involves the detonation of the fuel-air mixture which produces a shock wave in the combustor. This shock wave acts as a barrier similar to a piston, allowing the pressure to build up behind it. And this allows the combustion to behave more like a constant volume process without the need of valves. Moving parts like valves in a hot combustor are a potential source of error or failure, so removing such components improves engine reliability. Despite a lot of research into this technology to date, there have not, has not been any commercial products developed using it. However, it's interesting to note that history can repeat even in technology. Okay, so that concludes this video. I hope you liked it. If you did, please click the like button below. And if you'd like to see more videos like this one, please subscribe to the channel. Additionally, if there are topics related to gas turbine engines you would like to know more about, please make a suggestion in the comments. Thanks.